Hello, I'm Alec Avdekov, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. Well, that hiatus took a lot longer than I expected. I'll give you a brief update on what has been going on in my life since my last episode that was back in... Hang on, let me look at my watch. September! Ooh. So first off, I quit my old job and moved to the Toledo area. I also began to substitute teach. It has been an adjustment, but I have enjoyed teaching a heck of a lot. With that, I also began to focus on being with people I care about more of. This left me with less time to focus on writing scripts as well. I also fell into a little bit of a mental block where I could not find a sufficient topic that I could continue the story with. However, I finally decided on a topic that I felt would be interesting for me to talk about. I apologize to people who have donated to me on Patreon. There will be a more consistent uploading schedule. I was simply going through many things all at once. So, I thank you all for your patience, and let's jump right into today's topic. So, in the last episode, Frederick made peace with the Austrians for the second time in the decade on Christmas Day of 1745. This was after the Prussian army won two key battles. Frederick commanded the victory over the Austrians in the Battle of Sor, and the old Dessauer defeated the Saxons in the Battle of Kesselsdorf. After these victories, these two armies united and occupied the capital of Saxony, Dresden. While negotiating with the Austrians and Saxons in Dresden, Frederick listened to an opera by one of his favorite composers, Johann Adolf Hasse. I decided that I should continue with the theme of music for this episode. Yup, this will be a look into the music Frederick the Great composed, the music of his court, and a lesser known meeting between Frederick and the most famous composer of that generation. Frederick's fascination with music began in childhood. He developed a particular fondness for the flute. This was mainly in rebellion to the wishes of his father. Let's go back to the episode about Frederick Wilhelm's political testament. Back in 1722, King Frederick Wilhelm I wrote, quote, Neither must my dear successor allow comedies, operas, ballets, masks, or redoubts to be held within his lands and provinces. He must abhor them, because these are godless and devilish things whereby Satan, his temple, and kingdom are increased. So clearly, he was not a fan that Frederick had become passionate about flute music. Frederick was first exposed to music when he and his father went on a trip to Saxony in 1728 when Frederick was 16. He listened to two of the most skilled and famous composers in Dresden at the time, Johann Adolf Hasse and Johann Joachim Quantz. From that moment until Frederick lost his teeth in old age, a flute was a constant daily companion for him. However, Despite constant beatings from his father's cane, Frederick was instructed how to compose music starting at age seven. When I first read this, it astounded me that despite Frederick Wilhelm's compulsion for complete control in every facet of his son's life starting from a young age, Frederick was still able to learn music. It generally surprised me that a man, Frederick Wilhelm, known for his random rage outbursts for the smallest thing, would allow this to happen. So, if I'm going to talk about the overall role of music in Frederick the Great's life and times, weirdly enough, I'm going to have to start with King Frederick Wilhelm's financial policy. As a rule, Frederick Wilhelm believed that anything that didn't have to do with the army, efficient administration, Protestant Christianity, and hunting was evil, bad, and sinful. Therefore, he viewed music as, quote, effeminate, and not worth the time and money. Frederick Wilhelm died in 1740, and thus left Frederick with a kingdom that had no tradition of music within its borders. This was, according to Tim Blanning's book, quote, 
painfully advertised when soloists had to be borrowed from the Saxon court to perform the oratorio written for Frederick Wilhelm I's funeral. Even though Frederick Wilhelm despised music with a passion and Prussia had no native cultivation of music, he left his son with a vast fortune. While most histories focus on the way Frederick made war with the money that his father left him, it also allowed Frederick to begin hiring top-class musicians. During his time as crown prince in 1732, he sent his architect to Dresden and then to the opera houses in Italy from 1736 through 1737 to study the different architectural designs of theaters and operas. Frederick also studied the designs of English architecture. It is therefore fitting that after Frederick's father died, the first thing Frederick ordered before any of the wars or battles he would command was to construct the Berlin State Opera House. But it was because of these outside events that the first foundation stone was set in place not by Frederick, but by his 15-year-old brother, Henry, on September 5, 1741. Even during a war against the Austrians, money was so available for Frederick that the first performance of the Opera House could be presented on December 5, 1742. This was one of Frederick's most incredible successes in architecture, especially if you consider how quickly it was constructed. The Berlin State Opera House could seat roughly 2,000 people. The audience members were impressed by the visibility of the stage, good ventilation for the time, and water that could be served to the guests. The water tanks in the opera could also be used to provide special effects on stage and set out fires. The most unique thing about this opera house was that it was the first freestanding opera house in Europe. By that, I mean that opera houses everywhere else in Europe were connected to the ruling class's palaces. In some cases, like that of Versailles, the opera house was within the palace itself. Frederick showed off that this palace was freestanding and has been said that there was room for up to 1,000 horse-drawn coaches around this building. The opera was also a political tool for Frederick in his crusade against religiosity. After all, Frederick hated the idea of the so-called religious superstition of the time that was widely popular across Europe. When naming the opera house, Frederick combined his disdain for Christianity, his love of classical literature, and his hope for the popularization of the arts in public. Rather than following the lead of other rulers of the time by naming the opera house Théâtre Royal de saint Frédéric or the Royal Theater of St. Frederick, Frederick named it Friedericus Rex Apollini et Musis. This means that the theater was dedicated to, quote, Apollo and the Muses by King Frederick. For an opera house to function, however, it must have music to be played within its walls. Since one of Frederick's defining personality traits was that he was a gigantic control freak, he would be in charge of what music would be performed. He would also spearhead the effort to bring in the best performers from all around Europe, although he mainly hired Italian performers. Frederick had a very, I'll put this generously, unique taste in music. He was a huge fan of late 1600s French music, yet believed the French music scene was on the decline since the death of Louis XIV. But he was overall in favor of French language productions. However, due to the available money reserves, Frederick was able to hire the best singers. He preferred Italians. There were names like Giovanni Carastini, Paolo Badeschi, and Benedetta Molteni, to count a few. But, despite my original misconception that Frederick was deeply in love with everything French in terms of culture, Frederick was staunchly in support of German composers. Frederick was even attributed to have said, quote, The French only know how to write drama, and the Italians only know how to sing. The Germans alone understand how to write music. The three most important composers he had within the Prussian court at the time were Karl Heinrich Graun, Johann Joachim Kranz, and Karl Philipp 
Emmanuel Bach. Carl Philippe was the son of the much more famous, in today's terms, Johann Sebastian Bach. These men were all greats in late Baroque music. However, since this podcast is focused on Frederick the Great, I'm going to focus my time on the music that Frederick composed rather than those of his court. His most famous compositions were four flute concertos and a symphony in D major. Frederick composed a total of 121 works until he stopped in 1756. However, by 1738, two years before he would become king, he realized that he could not make his own mark compared to the other composers of his day, and mainly wrote flute sonatas to be performed in private. I will play a sample of Frederick's second flute concerto he composed. This sample was downloaded from Internet Archive Digital Library, and is within the public domain. Here it is. For the last few months, I have been listening to various Baroque music of the time, composed by Johann Sebastian Bach, Johann Adolf Hasse, and Georg Telemann. The music that Frederick wrote was certainly good for the time, but it was not groundbreaking stuff. This seems to be the overall consensus among contemporaries and music scholars today. People of the time who heard Frederick perform agreed that he was skilled when it came to the flute. Here's a quote about Frederick's performance from Charles Burney, an English musician and music historian who visited Potsdam. Charles wrote regarding Frederick's performance, quote, The concert began with a German flute concerto, in which His Majesty executed the solo parts with great precision. His embouchure, the way you put your mouth on your instrument, was clear and even, his finger brilliant, and his taste pure and simple. I was much pleased and even surprised with the neatness of his execution in the Allegros as well as by his expression and feeling in the Adagios. However, not everyone felt the same way about Frederick's performances. It is said from multiple sources that Frederick struggled when he played at a quick tempo. In fact, there is a quote in David Fraser's book on Frederick the Great that discusses a performance that went quite badly due to the mistakes of the king. Frazier wrote, quote, Frederick was responsible for a flute solo in a new unrehearsed piece at one of the regular six o'clock concerts, Features of the Day at Sans Souci. He made a mistake and the place was lost. Quantz, never particularly tolerant and a professional musician before courtier, snorted nasally and very audibly. The quote goes on to say, quote, Frederick asked him a few days later to tell him whether he'd got the piece wrong. Yes, sire. Then you'd better write out the score again, said Frederick. As was said earlier, it was a regular thing that Frederick would perform a daily flute concert when he was at his palace in Sans Souci. Quans was the main guy who wrote the music that the king would play. In fact, Quans wrote 299 flute concertos for Frederick. I'm sure many of you with OCD are wishing that Kranz could have written just one more, but he died before he could. Kranz was also in the classic joke that went around later in Frederick's reign, and goes something like this. Who rules Prussia? Why, Mrs. Kranz's lapdog, of course. Frederick does what Kranz tells him, Kranz does what his wife tells him, and she is in thrall with her dog. Considering Frederick's love for dogs, this seems legit. Let's finish this episode with a very interesting story that took place two years after the end of the Second Silesian War. It was May 7th, 1747, when an extremely famous composer would arrive in Potsdam to meet with Frederick the Great. Here is the story of the extremely underappreciated meeting between Frederick the Great and Johann Sebastian Bach. 
So, Johann Sebastian had been working in the court of Leipzig in the electorate of Saxony for the past two decades. Even though anyone who knows a small thing about music of the Baroque era has heard of Johann Sebastian Bach, the elder Bach was not the most well-known musician who had the last name of Bach. It was, in fact, his son who was known as the great Bach, rather than Johann Sebastian. His son was named Karl Philipp Emanuel Bach, and by the time Johann and Frederick would meet, Karl was already hired as a musician in Frederick the Great's court. In fact, Karl was extremely underpaid for the talents he possessed. Karl was being paid only 300 dollars per year compared to the Italian singers, one of whom was being paid up to 6,000 dollars per year by Frederick. Johann had visited his son in Berlin during the First Silesian War, but Frederick was campaigning during that time, so there was no chance of Johann meeting him. But now that the first two Silesian Wars had ended, Johann felt that he would be able to travel to Potsdam. Johann's main motivation for traveling to Potsdam was to see his son. There was a war between Saxony and Prussia since the last time Johann had made a journey to the Prussia's capital. He had not met his son's wife, nor their first child. That's right, Johann Sebastian Bach could not see his grandson, who was named Johann Adam. Johann's other son, Wilhelm Friedemann Bach, would also take the journey to Potsdam for similar reasons as his father. Wilhelm had not seen his sister-in-law nor his nephew. However, the upcoming meeting between the famous Saxon composer and the Prussian king was something that loomed as father and son took the carriage ride up to Potsdam. They would arrive in the evening of May 7th, 1747, and were immediately summoned to the town palace in Potsdam. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of Johann Sebastian Bach as he was being led from the carriage to the palace. Keep in mind that roads were definitely not paved at the time, and Prussian roads had a pretty bad reputation by the people of that time. So, you know that tiredness and soreness feeling you get from a bumpy car ride? Well, multiply that feeling by a thousand times, and we might get closer of how Bach was feeling as he was being hurried to Frederick's concert room. Johann Sebastian Bach also had the intimidation factor. After all, this was the man who, in the first year of his reign alone, set out to build an opera house, published a philosophical book, and declared war on one of the most powerful ruling families in Europe. Frederick definitely had a reputation for being a giant among men. Johann was also wearing his riding clothes because he didn't have time to change his clothes before he met with Frederick. So, this weather-beaten old man was about to meet with Europe's fastest rising star. There is not a clear account of what took place during Bach's meeting with Frederick. However, we can trace the events. Bach first entered Frederick's concert room and made a courtly bow in front of the king. At some point in time, Frederick showed Bach a new invention of the time. It was a keyboard that could play notes softly or loudly, depending on how one was to hit the note. This wild invention is known as the piano. Frederick loved this type of keyboard and collected as many as he physically could. According to the book Evening in the Palace of Reason, Bach meets Frederick the Great in the Age of Enlightenment by James Gaines, Frederick led Bach around from one piano to another throughout his palace. There were in fact 15 of these newfangled pianos scattered throughout Frederick's palace. But Bach was not infatuated with the piano as Frederick was. Bach believed that the high notes played too softly and the keyboard was too stiff. But here Bach was playing an instrument he did not like at the insistence of the Prussian king. Frederick then sat down of one of the pianos and played a theme of only 21 notes and asked Bach to improvise a fugue based upon this theme. But 
Frederick's theme made it nearly impossible for Bach to improvise a fugue. It was unknown whether this theme came directly from Frederick's brain or not. It could have been Quanz, Graun, or even his son Karl who wrote this theme and passed it on to Frederick. We simply will never know. My guess is that Frederick asked one of these men to come up with a theme that Bach could not improvise a fugue from, and Frederick would pass it off as his own. Here is how the theme would have been played that evening. So, I am no musicologist, and I know very little about how to construct and perform a fugue. But, there are at least five levels of complexity that go into a fugue in order for it to be called a fugue. Bach was forced to do that with a theme that was practically impossible to do. On the spot. I physically cannot imagine the amount of pressure Bach was put under. But, here is what made Bach so great. He set himself down at the piano and thought for a while. Then, he played something that blew away those who were there. Here is a recording of the piece that Bach would later publish as a musical offering. The first movement of that piece is based on the fugue Bach made up on the spot. Bach was able to, in a seven-minute piece, interwove the theme Frederick gave him 12 times throughout that piece. In fact, you can hear a bit of that within that sample. The fact that it doesn't sound choppy and sounds competent and smooth and complex as Bach always tends to be is nothing less than genius. In the newspaper account of the time, the audience of the most talented musicians roared with applause to this masterful performance. But, as soon as the applause died down and Bach started to get up from the piano bench, Frederick stepped forward. He said to Bach, Herr Bach, might we hear a six-part fugue, if you please? How frickin' rude, Fritz! You just saw the performance of a lifetime, and you asked this poor old man to come up with an even more complex work? That's just crappy right there. So, you can imagine that Bach, after traveling in a carriage for two whole days and given no time to prepare, was just fuming. Frederick had invaded Saxony back in 1745 and was deemed to be a slimy character in the court of Leipzig, where Bach lived. But Bach had not dreamed he would be met with such disrespect Frederick had given him. Bach would then perform a six-part fugue that was not based on the theme Frederick had given him. Bach would eventually get some sleep that night once he left the presence of the king. He was then summoned to meet Frederick once again, but this time, Bach would no longer have to play the piano. Bach was told that he would tour the organs of Potsdam. All the organs scattered throughout Potsdam. Now for one of my favorite quotes a historian has ever written about a 1700s composer. This quote was written by James Gaines. He wrote, Frederick, quote, plainly thinks of Bach as no more than Prussia's latest royal executor of puzzles, someone about as important to him as a farting duck. If I ever meet Mr. Gaines, I would immediately give him a round of applause for writing this inspired piece of literature. Anyway, 
Bach would play the four organs scattered throughout Potsdam and leave later that day. For all the anguish and disrespect that Bach had suffered for those two days, Frederick gave him no reward for his visit. Frederick didn't even send Bach a letter of thanks. Mind you, Frederick had given Johann Adolf Hasse a diamond ring for his performance in Dresden a year and a half earlier. Talk about a major snuff. Ironically, if you were to ask an average person if they knew who Bach was, they would be more likely to say yes than if you asked the same question about Frederick the Great. So, if it's a matter of outlasting legacy, I would say Johann Sebastian Bach won the right to have the last laugh. So, there you have it. Frederick built up the musical tradition in Berlin from non-existence, he composed multiple pieces of his own, and of course, he snubbed one of the most important composers in world history. Thank you all for your patience in waiting this long for this episode to be produced. If you like what you hear, feel free to write a review from where you listen. To support this podcast further, you can donate to this podcast on Patreon. The link is in the show notes below. To conclude today's episode, I would like to say to you all to be a kind and respectful person. Hate is not worth it.